many researchers are working at the moment on really interesting questions about how technology and communication interact. So there are really fascinating questions about what happens to online communities when people can communicate anonymously, or what happens when people communicate via text or by, say, 140 character chunks. These questions are fascinating, but it's really striking that when we want to have a discussion about something that matters, we actually don't really rely on technology. We still just sit around a table, open the holes in our faces, jibber jabber, and that's pretty much how we do it when it matters. So um, that's pretty much the state of the art in technology for in-person discussions. This image captures nicely the theme that technology is really drawing us away from the things that matter. If you search your favorite image search engine for a distracted person, about half of the images will show you people being distracted by their gizmos. The same thing is true if you search for a distracted student. It's inevitably something to do with technology. So today, I want to talk about one way we can use technology to improve the quality of the discussions that we're having in the classroom. That is to say, in-person discussions. So group discussions are a very natural place to begin. Because whenever more than five or six people get together in a group to have a discussion, they face a problem. They need to figure out a way to decide who gets to talk next and for how long. They need to decide on whose voice will be heard. The usual way of doing this uh, probably hasn't changed in 50,000 years. That is to say some sort of senior person, maybe the tribal leader or a professor, will stand at the front of the group and will pick people who have opted into the discussion by dangling their hands in the air above their heads. That's pretty much the way we do it now. But that generates some really big problems. So all of these problems derive in various ways from the fact that the moderator, the person choosing who gets to talk next, has no information that's actually relevant to promoting a good discussion. So the moderator doesn't know what anyone wants to say, doesn't know how strongly they want to say it, doesn't know how valuable this contribution would be instead of a different contribution that we might choose instead. So the moderator is in this information poor environment. Um, I thought a really nice way to explain this to you would be to look at some photos of students in discussions. But then I discovered that if you just went by the brochures that colleges and universities produce, you would be very misled and deceived about the nature of college. So one thing you would go thinking is that everybody asks questions in class, or nearly everybody. But a more subtle way that you would be deceived is you would think that everyone either puts their hands up nice and high, unambiguously wanting to contribute, or they put their hands down really clearly and low unambiguously not wanting to contribute. Actually, luckily, I got a photo of the audience earlier today, and so we can look at what real people actually look like. So here you are, uh, earlier in an earlier talk, and as you can see, many people are doing what the people in the stock photos do. They have their hands up nice and high, maybe it's that guy from your philosophy precept, <laughs> or they have their hands down really clearly, but they also assume a variety of intermediate and ambiguous poses. <laughs> As you can see, uh, this person up there is, you know, pretty low hand. This one down here, actually, it looks like from the blur, like this person was actually going to reach up high. They, they really wanted to express a strong desire to contribute, but they were just a bit slower. So this illustrates that when we use hand raising to distribute discussions, to moderate and decide who gets to talk, things like brute speed, how fast you raise your hand, will determine whose voice gets heard. A host of really interesting other features will also play a role. Things like how introverted or extroverted are you? Um, how comfortable do you feel in social situations? And then a really interesting one, how socially desirable is it for you to communicate to the whole class that you really want to contribute? That last one is really interesting because we know that it varies between different groups. So here is um, some data from a study that two Harvard economists did. It looked at data on how popular kids are in high school, objective measures of popularity for 90,000 students. And what they look at here is the relationship between how popular you are and your GPA, your grades at high school. So what you find for white kids is roughly what you would expect. The kid with the 4.0 and 3.0 is got more friends, about one, one or two more friends, than the uh, kid who's flunking. This, however, is not true for black students. There you can see there's very little benefit for clearing the first three points on the GPA scale. And then actually, it might even turn around for the fourth point. 
And the situation is even more dire for Hispanic students. So this suggests that different students from different groups will incur different costs when they raise their hand to indicate that they wish to contribute. And they will incur those costs whether or not they actually get to contribute. Simply putting yourself forward, having a chance, is enough to broadcast to all of your friends that you're pretty eager to contribute to class, that you're a studious person. And that may have different costs for you. OK, so the sorts of factors that we should probably expect will play a big role in the psychology of hand raising or determining which of those many intermediate and ambiguous poses people assume. Well, um, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, given that these are the sorts of things that are doing the work, that actually, um, who gets to talk in a classroom might depend on prejudice and bias. This is an extremely widespread practice. It's important to remember, this is a photograph from a seminar which, uh, or a conference that I sat in not too long ago. Um, this is professional people, a whole lot of people uh, who've got PhDs in philosophy and politics, and they do the same thing as these kids who are uh, preschool aged. They raise their hands and someone who doesn't know anything picks people arbitrarily. Well, I want to think about uh, how we can do that better. But just to give you a sense of the scale, there's about 1.3 billion students in the world. If each one of them raises their hand about once every five hours of instruction, and you're about half a meter up and half a meter down, you can calculate that actually in an average year, the world's students move their hands through a distance of 234 billion meters, which to put that into perspective is 6,000 times around the Earth or one and a half times the distance to the sun. It actually takes about 100 billion seconds or 40 human lifetimes every year for just students dangling their hands. That's as best as a really conservative estimate. OK, so um, where else do we use this? Well, education extensively. Teachers love hand raising. Q&A, boardrooms, political uh, debate, and ethical inquiry. These are things which matter deeply. So why are we still using caveman technology to do it? The question bothered me. And I started to think about a better way to moderate group discussions. And because I work in education, I've been thinking about this in the context of classrooms. And so in the remainder of this talk, I just want to tell you a little bit about how I've been doing that. Humans are remarkably good at many, many things. But we are not good at the sorts of things you need to be good at to moderate a discussion. For example, no one in this room can keep track of how many seconds each of 15 people has spent contributing to a discussion for the last 30 minutes. No one in this room could even know, much less calculate and remember, uh, what sort of contributions a variety of people want to make. So like I've said a few times, we just guess. Well, computers are extremely good at this. Computers are extremely good at measuring accurate things and doing calculations very quickly. If we could get software to take care of this part of moderating a discussion, we would free the humans to do the thing which they are uniquely good at, listening really carefully to our students, thinking hard about what they need to hear to learn more. So I've been thinking about uh, building an app to do this. The app is extremely simple. It's currently a prototype. It's called Palava. And the main way of interacting with it uh, for students is just by dragging this slider to indicate how much they want to talk. Of course, they can do this very privately just using their cell phones. So when you drag the slider, the app will detect that you want to talk and it will then enter you into the queue. If you're not happy with where you ended up in the queue, you can say you want to talk more urgently and see if that bumps you up further. You shouldn't try that trick too often though because it is normalizing the values that come off these sliders. So overly dominant and overly shy students are over time treated quite equally. So uh, the moderator's interface, uh, if you know the professor or, or graduate student, is also dead simple. It is basically two buttons, the button to select the next speaker and the button to start a new topic. So when students enter the discussion, they indicate whether they want to make a comment following up on something someone has already said or whether they want to contribute a substantially new idea. And so the moderator can select when they're ready to go down a new pathway. The moderator will see the queue updated in real time. They don't have to juggle any of this information anymore early in the semester. Of course, it'll be really nice not having to remember students' names, which always terrifies me. <laughs> and uh, generally, they will be free to now focus on being a better teacher. So uh, let's just step through how it works. When it's finally your turn to talk, the app will tell you that. You can set a warning. If you're someone who maybe uh, tends to ramble a little bit 
or you're again like that guy from the philosophy precept, you might actually not want to be that guy. And so you might elect to have a timer set, which alerts you whenever you've been talking for 30 seconds, say. And so that's uh, really easy to configure. This really isn't at all rocket science. So the app will tell you 30 seconds. The moderator, the person running the discussion, decides on a hard limit. How long do you want to let people ramble on for? Let's say we set it to 90 seconds. Then when you get close to that limit, it will start counting down and then it will cut you off. So it is never going to happen in a precept or a discussion section where they're using this that someone gets to take over and dominate the entire conversation. It's extremely difficult for moderators, especially early on in teaching careers, to say to that student, I think we've had enough of this idea now. Let's put it on the table and maybe we'll return to it if we have time. It's really hard to confront a person like that. This means we never need to do that again. Um, the other really cool transformative effect of switching away from hand raising and using these globally interconnected supercomputers in our pockets is that we now get analytics, you know, like Fitbit, but for your discussions. So we get a second by second accurate measure of who spoke and who wanted to speak. And for example, you could get an email that automatically notifies you, you spoke more than 96% of students at Princeton University this week. If you got that message, you might modulate your own behavior without anyone having to confront you in this awkward way and say, you know, you're really smart. No one else can understand what you want to tell them. So why don't you just come to office hours? I tried that once, it actually worked. Um, <laughs> so this is a system which can automatically send people non-judgmental feedback on how they're performing in discussions. Of course, this applies for shy students as well. Maybe you are able to sit in discussions hardly talking at all, but you can convince yourself, I don't know, maybe I'm in the bottom 15%. Well, if you learned that you were actually contributing less than 96% of students at your college, maybe you would automatically try to contribute a bit more. So this could have a really transformative effect. And the answer is, we don't know whether it will do anything. We don't know how any of this will work because we've never really studied it. So how does this app work? The queuing algorithm is really flexible. It basically takes uh, metadata about the discussion to determine who gets to talk next. So it's really not rocket science. It counts the number of times you've wanted to contribute to the discussion. It counts how long you got to talk for. It counts the strength of your desire to speak. But again, remember, you can't game it too much by just if you're someone who just always thinks what you have to say is unbelievably important and must be right now, it will just start to ignore you. <laughs> um, OK, and other discussion metadata. So an effective and fair moderation system has got to be informed by a study of real discussions that students actually have in classroom. When students start to use this app, they will have the opportunity to contribute to a scientific research project where we will ask them a whole lot of introductory questions, questions about their sex and gender and race and nationality, educational background, socioeconomic background, and also interesting questions about things like their openness to experience, uh, their experience of social anxiety. And we'll be able to see what happens when you look at different groups of people and put them all together in a room. Is it true that the group composition really has an effect on how well the discussion goes. Can we not just randomly put students into precepts, but begin with some predictions about which groups will have the best discussions? None of these are questions that we can answer now, but hopefully we'll have a data set very soon that will allow us. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope I'll get to update you on the results of this study soon.